talking about how Christmases can sometimes be challenging in our modern world, and it's been a reminder that Christmas, the first Christmas, was challenging in the ancient world. It was challenging for the people who were part of it. Um, there was disappointment. There was uh, some frustrations and anxieties. There were unmet expectations. And tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about an individual who experienced and wrestled with the question, why me? And that is Joseph. Joseph, the man who would become the earthly father of Jesus. We have become so familiar with the Christmas story and the characters in this story. One of the greatest challenges in the Christmas story is telling it in a way as if to hear it for the first time so that we can be renewed and refreshed in the meaning of Christmas because we tend to look at these characters and what happens, and I think this is true in the culture more than it is in the church, but certainly in our world, there's this tendency to kind of uh, make these Christmas fables where they're kind of more legend and folklore uh, rather than real Christmas stories. And we need to remember these are real people who experienced a really amazing, amazing thing. We need to remember that this is history. This is history. And so it's easy to minimize what happened. And as I've been challenging you throughout the series, tonight especially, I really want to encourage you to try to put your mind back to the first century and try to walk in the shoes of this guy named Joseph. His was a life of altered expectations. He thought life would turn out a certain way, and it didn't. In fact, in many ways, until the full meaning of it came full circle, in many ways, it turned out just the opposite of what he had expected. Joseph is the perfect person to identify with if you're trying to reconcile reality versus your expectations, if you're trying to reconcile faith versus doubt, if you're trying to reconcile your way that life should turn out versus God's way. In fact, I've got a little chart I want to show you. All right, some of you have seen this. This is kind of typical of your plans for you, right? Kind of a nice, easy bike ride, little bitty incline all the way to the finish line. That's your plans for you, but this is God's plans for you (laughs) and for me. You see the little bike here, and there's some rocks she's got to go over, and then this bridge go across, and then she's got to get in the boat and cross these rough waters, maybe a zip line or two, you know, the thunderstorms, climbing the ladder, and then finally, with all the valleys and all the challenges, then we arrive at our destination. And that is so true with the life of Joseph. So today, I want you to be encouraged Because if God is in control, then he has a purpose, and he's got a plan. And even with all the detours, with all the disappointments, and with all the delays, as we see here, God achieves that plan, even in the midst of imperfect Christmases. So I want to talk about how it's hard to follow God's plan. Because here at the beginning, let's talk about kind of honestly how difficult it is to go God's way, to follow his plan And what are some characteristics of that challenge? Well, first of all, it's hard to follow God's plan when God's way doesn't make sense. And we're logical beings, right? And for the life of you, the life of me, at times, you cannot see how this could be God's way. (laughs) You know, you have this deep feeling, well, maybe God's trying to do something, and this is God's method, but it hurts. It's difficult to actually enact. Uh, There are easier ways to achieve what life should be about. And so it's hard to, when it just doesn't make sense to you, it's like a square peg in a round hole. It's just not fitting together. It's not logical. It doesn't make sense. And there's a challenge when life doesn't make sense to follow God's way. Secondly, when my reputation is at stake. (laughs) My reputation is at stake. Listen, when people make accusations, when you're following God's plan, you'd rather just bail on God's plans. You would. Don't want it don't need it, I'm out, you know, I don't need the accusations, I don't, I don't need that in my life, so when following God cost us, the one thing that we'd rather not pay is status, the one thing we'd rather not pay is rejection of people, we'd rather not pay 
are standing in people's eyes, but following God's plan at some point is not going to be popular with others who are around us, nor will it gain the approval of everybody. And yet still it's challenging. And then finally, it's hard to follow God's plans when life's dreams go unrealized. When you have expectations and dreams and they're shattered. Life was supposed to turn out differently. Things were supposed to be a certain way. So, when dreams are shattered, we often believe that we've missed out. Think about it. We think we've missed out. We think it's too late. We think that things can't be repaired. We think the opportunity is lost, and we think the rest of life has now taken this course, and life is ruined. But here's what we learn from Joseph. We learn from Joseph that in the end, none of these challenges listed here deterred him from going God's way rather than turn to his own. In the end, he said yes to God. So let's look at the scripture here. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Here's the story of Joseph. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And that's the verse that Aaron just read earlier from Luke chapter 1. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Isn't it amazing to you how every time the angels announced surrounding the birth of Jesus, every time the first thing out of their mouth was do not be afraid. It was do not be afraid to Zechariah. It was do not be afraid to the shepherds. It's do not be afraid to Joseph. It was do not be afraid to to Mary. Following God's plan can be a little bit scary, but the angels reminded them, don't be afraid, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus literally means. He always saves. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. That's, of course, the prophet Isaiah. Notice how many times the angels are proclaiming fulfilled prophecy in the birth of Jesus. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus, just as he was told to do. He gave him the name Jesus. Well, tonight, I want us to look at this amazing individual. I'm so inspired by this guy. We know very little about, about Joseph, but What we know about him is tremendously powerful for us to think about the question, why me? Why am I the one having to walk this path that God has for me? So let's look at Joseph's quiet courage. Here's some characteristics of it. First of all, he was a man of honor. He was a man of honor. Look at verse 19 again, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. He was a very righteous man. He was a righteous Jew. He was faithful to the law. He had sincere yearnings to honor God in his life, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. You see the contrast there, because by law, Mary should have been punished by Jewish law, because the presumption here is that she had committed some form of adultery. He did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly, and you say, well, that's bad that he would do that. No, actually, that was a gift of grace to Mary, legally He could have accused her. He could have brought her before the leaders, and she could have been stoned by his accusation. She could have lost her life because of it. So this speaks volumes about Joseph. More than our actions, our reactions speak more about our character than anything else. I read this week that you can tell a lot about a man by how he handles three things. Bad traffic, God forgive me, lost luggage, and tangled Christmas tree lights. (laughs) I think that's really true. I just put up my lights last week, and I'm out there trying to untangle them in the cold. So how how you deal with things, how you deal with life when it doesn't turn out as expected, when you have unplanned, unexpected frustration or disappointment is a huge indication of your character or the lack thereof. For Joseph to cooperate with God in this process meant him losing face. This was a reputable 
man. A man who wanted to honor God and to take Mary, though pregnant, to take her before they had actually consummated the marriage. This was a huge reputation destroyer. It was huge. And man, when it comes to losing face, we're all about saving face, aren't we? So when God's plan in our lives involves looking less before others, we question God's plan. Get this. Please understand what's going on here in the first century. The Bible says that they were engaged to be married, and it's really stronger than that. They were betrothed is the old King James word, more than engaged. According to the law, they were legally married yet had, again, not consummated the marriage. So to end what they had at that point as being betrothed meant that he would need to divorce her because that betrothal was a time of preparation for the marriage. The man would spend a full year earning a keep and earning a living in order to support his family, but she was pregnant. And here's what we learned about Joseph. Even before the angel showed up, listen, before he even found out how it happened, he decided quietly in his heart that he would discreetly divorce her. He would do everything in his power to minimize the impact upon her, make sure that she suffered as little pain as possible. It makes me believe that he genuinely loved her. But it also makes me understand that he was a man of honor. What is the normal reaction for us when disappointment comes and frustration comes and we are thrown these kinds of curveballs? How will this affect me? What was Joseph's reaction? How will this affect Mary? What will this do to her? So his faith in God was centered and couched in a moral question. What is the right thing to do here? What is the honorable thing to do here? And he was truly a man of honor. Secondly, he was a man of obedience. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. What's interesting and amazing to me is really throughout all the Christmas story with each of these people, each interaction is always followed by obedience. What is instructed to these people in the, Christ, in the Christmas story by the angels is what they end up doing. And here's a point for us, I think a takeaway for us. You cannot have high levels of faith in God while participating in low levels of obedience to him. Faith ultimately means actually obeying. It means actually doing what he is asking us to do. Faith is not just some concept. It's a path to walk. It's not a cliche to recite. You must step onto a path and begin to walk it, and God has a path for each one of us, a path of obedience. Hebrews 11.1, 1, you know that. The definition of faith, faith is conviction of things hoped for, the assurance of things not seen. So faith, by definition, demands courage on our part. It demands the will to act, not having every answer in advance, leaving the known and the familiar to push in the unknown and the unfamiliar and the uncomfortable. Only then do we experience the rewards of trust on that side of obedience. Have you guys ever had somebody tell you about an experience that they had, something that you had never tried before, but they just absolutely loved? They were raving about how awesome this experience was. Maybe it was to try a food, and you're like, I don't think so. I don't, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it was food or uh, a roller coaster or a trip to the mountains or skydive or maybe even goat yoga right? (laughs) And then you tried it, and you actually loved it. You're like, oh, (laughs) you understood what they were trying to tell you now all along based upon their experience. They were telling you about this adventure and that you should step out, that you should do it only by the experience could you understand the reward of being involved in it, being engaged in it. So faith for Joseph was to put away notions that it didn't make sense, to put away notions that it didn't add up, to put away notions of his reputation, to take Mary, to care for her, and to be a father to this child. And that's exactly what he did. He did what he was commanded to do by God. He was a man of obedience. Here's the last thing that's true about Joseph and his courage. He was a man chosen 
for a purpose. A man chosen for a purpose. I have a verse here up on the screen from Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. This is God to Moses in the midst of the plagues going on in Egypt. Now remember, Moses was a fugitive. He had spent 40 years in the wilderness being a shepherd, and God called him back to go to, to, go to Egypt. Eventually, though reluctantly, he went, and he begins to speak to power and warn Pharaoh that if he does not let uh, the Jewish people go, then he will suffer the consequences. And so in the midst of all that, here's what God says to Moses about his purpose on this earth. He says to Moses, I have raised you up for this very purpose. That is to go to Moses. Now, he took a, about an 80-year detour to that. But eventually he got to God's purpose. Remember the bike ride. Eventually, Moses cooperated. I have raised you up for this very purpose that I might show you my power. For what reason have I raised you up? That I might show you my power, Moses, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That's it. That's the sole purpose he has for all of his plans in our lives. Bottom line, that is it that he might reveal his power to us, that we might really experience him in this life of faith, and that his name might be proclaimed in all the earth. It was true for Moses. It's true for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Nehemiah. It was true for Esther. And by the way, I am so excited. We're going to start the new year with a series through the book of Esther. And she's, again, the top five uh, biblical characters on my list. And it's just going to be a wonderful, wonderful way to start the new year. I hope that you'll be here for it. But it was God's will for her, for all these other people. And it was God's will for Joseph, that he would raise Joseph up so that Joseph himself might experience the power of God and that the name of God might be proclaimed in all the earth. And guess what? This is true for you. This is true for me also. He wants to raise us up for a purpose. And our response will determine if we are the ones to be used to see his power and to see his name proclaimed. And Joseph was just willing. A real guy struggling with real faith in this real desperate situation, he was willing to go God's way. So we don't know much about Joseph, just about everything we know I've shared with you today because Joseph is only mentioned when Jesus is young. Once Jesus becomes an adult, Joseph is not mentioned anymore except in reference to Jesus being the carpenter's son. Mary is mentioned uh, all the time throughout the adult ministry of Jesus. So what happened to Joseph? Well, most scholars believe that while Jesus was still a young man before he entered his public ministry, that his earthly father, Joseph, died. So when Jesus came into the world, we know he had to borrow a lot of things, didn't he? He had to borrow a manger to be born in throughout his life. He had to borrow a bed to sleep in. He had to borrow a little boy's lunch to feed the multitude. He had to borrow a donkey to ride in Jerusalem on the day of his triumphal entry. He even had to borrow a tomb when he dies. There's one other thing that Joseph had, that Jesus had to borrow. When God's son came into the world, he had to borrow a dad. And Joseph served as the earthly father of the Son of God. But the question remains. The question is, why him? Why Joseph? Well, it's a fair question. It's probably a question that Joseph asked himself. Can't you imagine? Why me? Why am I the one? There was a song that was written a few years ago. And it's called A Strange Way to Save the World. I want to read you some of the words because it's a song from Joseph's perspective. It says this, I'm sure he must have been surprised at where this road had taken him because never in a million years would he have dreamed of Bethlehem. And standing at the manger, he saw with his own eyes the message from the angel come to life. And Joseph said, why me? I'm just a simple man of trade. Why him? with all the other rulers in the world. Why here inside a stable filled with hay? Why her? She's just an ordinary girl. 
Now, I'm not one to second guess what angels have to say. But this is a strange way to save the world. To think it how, how it could have been if Jesus had come as he deserved. There would have been no Bethlehem, no lowly shepherds at his birth. But Joseph knew the reason love had to reach so far. And as he held the Savior in his arms, he must have thought, why me? Why me? This is such a strange way to save the world. God knew why Joseph. God knew what Joseph didn't know. Think about how we've described this man tonight. Think about it for a second. Joseph chose the moral, honorable, responsible, right path, though difficult. Joseph submitted his plans to God's plans, though not completely understanding. Joseph risked and even ruined his reputation before others. Joseph courageously endured and followed through on the mission and the purpose that God had given him. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds like the character of the one born to him, doesn't it? Sounds like Jesus. Well, obviously, Joseph was chosen because Jesus had a lot to learn from this borrowed dad. Thank God for Joseph's faith and obedience. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been asked to do something by a boss? And out of all the people that he or she could have picked to do this job, they chose you. You were the one that were chosen. It wasn't grunt work. It was important, right? It was important to do, but it was going to take a lot of work, a lot of effort, some challenges, some pressure, uh, a lot from you that others would not have to expend. And you did it. And then let me ask you another question. Have you ever gone back to that boss and said, well, why me? (laughs) Why was I the one chosen to do this? Only for them to say, because I can count on you. Because I knew you could handle it. So and so would have crumbled under this. I'm giving this to you because it's important, because it needs to be done, and because I know that you can do it. God chose Joseph because, well, he didn't need him to achieve his sovereign will, he wanted him. He wanted this amazing man of faith and honor, because it was important to God, because it needed to be done, and God knew that Joseph could do it. He was a man of honor, he was a man of obedience, and he was a man who would be willing to walk a difficult path without giving up. And by the way, a path not about him, a burden not to benefit him a burden to carry for the sake of others. I mean, he would take responsibility where he didn't have to. He would risk his reputation when he didn't have to. And he would not do it for himself. But he would do it for the woman he loved and the child that he would be a father to. That's the man that we're talking about. It's the kind of man I'd like to be. The kind of person I'd like to be. That's the man who was the earthly father of Jesus. God knew exactly why he chose Joseph. He was the one to do this job as a man of honor, a man of obedience, and a man willing to walk a difficult path for the sake of the mission of God. So here's what I'd like to ask you to do. I want to ask you to bow your head. And tonight, and just a little bit differently, I want to give you just a moment to reflect upon this life that we've just talked about. Maybe, just maybe, as we've looked at the reasons why Joseph was in the place that he was, maybe that's why God has you where you are. It's not to be comfortable. It's not for your pleasure. It's not for the ease of it all. But he has you at this place, walking through this because he needs you to carry this so that he might achieve something greater than you. 
He has raised you up for this very purpose that he might show you and reveal to you his power that his name might be proclaimed in all the earth and that that would take place through you. Some of you may have gone through some things this year like many of us have where the only reason you were chosen for a particular assignment from God is because it needed to be done. Those circumstances, those changes, that plan needed to take place in order for God to achieve what he wants. And you were the one able to endure it. So he chose you. And even now, maybe he's choosing you. God is paying you a great compliment. He's saying to you, you've got big shoulders. I can trust you with this. You'll endure. You'll handle it the right way. It'll be difficult, but it needs to be done. It's important, and I need you to do it. There'll be challenges. There'll be fear. Sometimes the fear won't go away, so you'll have to do it afraid. But nonetheless, you'll walk the difficult path that God has for you. I imagine when Joseph looked in Mary at Jesus and at Jesus and when he held the baby in his arms, I imagine he would have said that it was all worth it. But before then, man, it was, it was tough. He didn't see the reward until after walking that path. My encouragement to you, my encouragement to all of us tonight is to keep walking. And to say, God, if you want me to, if you have this path for me, I will walk it. It may not be the way that I would have chosen. But you never said it would be easy. You only said that you would go with me. And that you would provide for me. So let me just give you a moment. to say to your Father in heaven, God, I will walk through the valley if you want me to. I will walk this difficult path if you want me to. Father, our corporate prayer is that we would be people like Joseph was. That we would be people of honor. He was a man who took the high road. That we would be people of obedience. That what you say we will do And by that obedience, through that obedience, we will witness on the other side that it was worth it. That we would be people like he was who would be willing to walk a difficult path that you chose him for us. And I know there are people in this room who are carrying burdens every day, who are serving others in some way, and they're walking a path that's that's tough and and one that causes weariness at times and they're doing it not for themselves but for someone else so I pray that you would encourage them God that you give them the deep deep satisfaction of of knowing and the peace of knowing that you've called them to this that it's a good thing that the work that they're doing is a work of you. It's the work of angels. It's the work of what is right and what is moral, what is upstanding and what is honorable. And that you would provide them the strength to keep walking that that path. Thank you that you're a, a God who, although calls us to go, never calls us to go alone. That you're with us 
each and every step of the way. So I pray that this Christmas, if we're dealing with the question of why me, why this path, why this circumstance, I pray that we would find the hope and encouragement that we learn from your word from this real man who took on the calling to be the earthly father of Jesus. Thank you for this amazing story. Thank you for preserving it in your word for us. Thank you for the encouragement that we gain from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.